coming back from the lunch <laughs> shop. It's always a dreadful thing to be in the after lunch speaker because usually this is the time when everyone takes a nap. <laughs> but I just got back from Australia uh, yesterday. Oh, oh. My new job is so actually I might take a nap. And you might take a nap. <laughs> yeah. so, um, I'm Richard Ryan. I'm now at the uh, Institute for Positive Psychology in Sydney. I used to be at the uh, University of Rochester where uh, some of the days work with me. And I've been working in a long position in the field of motivation, which we call self-determination theory. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very broad sweeping theory about human motivation and the drivers of human motivation. And uh, because it's a broad theory, we've been able to do research on almost anything we like. This is why I advise any students to go into the field of motivation, because it lets you study everything. Uh, so it's a beautiful thing. And, uh, we started our work uh, in the area of intrinsic motivation at DC and I many 35 years ago. And then since then, we just broadened to many other areas that uh, determinants of well being, the things that lead people to internalize values, uh, issues and cultural differences in basic needs and uh, human motives. So many different topics. And, uh, I'm therefore not used to giving a 20-minute talk uh, at all, but that's true for everybody here. So I decided just to do something pretty uh, small and recent, which had to do with investigations we've been doing on uh, helping and benevolence and some of the motivators that underlie it. And uh, partly I'm interested in this because I've been doing some writing with an evolutionary psychologist, Patty Hawley, from Texas Tech University. We doing some work on human aggression, and then we got interested in the other side of aggression, which was pro-social behavior. And one of the things that, uh, in, in reading in evolutionary psychology, in the old school of evolutionary psychology, there was a lot of uh, statements, kind of broad statements about the uh, hostile, competitive environment in the evolutionary adaptation that would lead us to have aggression, dominance, as common motives. But you know, those of you, everybody in this room, of course, knows that today's field of evolutionary psychology is very different. We know, in fact, that it's, that's only one part of the story. The other part is that we're group animals. Uh, therefore, there's a lot of selective advantage in cooperating and giving and helping one another, and that these are common behavior. Really, I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing. You're in a city like New York City, and uh, I don't know where I'm going, and you ask for directions. Almost everybody will help you. Just a couple people will do wrong. <laughs> Most people will help you, and that just shows the frequency of helping uh, behaviors, and they even get a kick out of it. And so one of the things that we were interested in is there must be some proximal psychological supports that drive a lot of volitional voluntary helping behavior and benevolent behavior that we do for one another. And that's kind of the basis for the few studies I want to talk about today. And just to kind of put the, our model uh, quite simply, we argue that since there are so many adaptive benefits to pro-social actions, uh, there should be some kind of intrinsic rewards that people experience when doing them, so they don't need always external incentives to drive these behaviors. And we're interested in what those intrinsic satisfactions might be. And, uh, I just want to say a couple words about our early work in intrinsic motivation because for some people it's kind of a controversial concept. But really we mean by this term just something that you do because it's inherently rewarding for doing it. You find satisfactions in the activity itself and so whether or not there are external instrumental rewards that uh, come upon it, it drives itself because of its uh, inherent uh, joy. And children's play is the prototype of intrinsic motivation because children don't play because it helps their brains develop it because people report them. They do it because it's fun and interesting. And a little more deeply than that, we say that uh, play and other intrinsically motivated behaviors are driven some, by some very basic psychological satisfactions. Uh, in group play, it's certainly the feeling of belonging and connection with the other uh, children who are playing. But also, it's feelings of mastery and efficacy and effectiveness that you get to have spontaneously occur when you're engaged in playful behavior. Uh, things that you can't accomplish or you can't master don't feel like fun anymore because they're no longer allowing you to have that experience of confidence. And uh, perhaps uh, most uh, interesting and controversial for us is the idea that play requires a sense of autonomy. If you're doing what you're doing volitionally, in any event in the environment that would lead you to not feel volitional in what you're doing will undermine your sense of enjoyment in that playful activity. There's been lots of experiments that we've done on this. So we do a lot of laboratory experiments where we take interesting activities and then we put people under different conditions that either spoil their autonomy or enhance their sense of autonomy. And we look at how much they then sustain interest, enjoyment, and behavior all the time using behavioral measures of intrinsic motivation. Um, and uh, you know, so uh, when you do things that have people feel positive feedback or optimal challenge, they're more likely to persist if you give them negative feedback or things that are too difficult. They'll find their task less interesting. If you treat them coldly, 
They find that anything that you do with them less interesting. Uh, and then, of course, autonomy. Perhaps one of the controversial findings has been the idea that when you reward somebody for doing something that's intrinsically motivated, sometimes that will undermine their intrinsic motivation because it decreases their sense of autonomy. So if I say, you do this and I will give you money, that you might like getting the money, but what you also feel is I'm controlling your behavior and this will undermine your subsequent interest in that activity, your intrinsic interest in that activity. There's lots of ways of showing this. I'm just going to show one recent experiment that was led by Ko Murayama. I've been doing some really cool studies with him recently on choice and uh, uh, his impact on, uh, on cognitive function. This is one that he uh, and his colleagues did. They wanted to show the undermining effect using an fMRI. So they came up with a game that you could actually play inside the fMRI magnet and find fun. There's very few things you can do in the magnet that are fun. Uh, but they found a little task that was kind of fun. It was a stopwatch game. And uh, when you stopped it, after trial, in session one, half the subjects were told that they would get paid uh, financial rewards for uh, accurate performance. And the other half, were, there was no mention of any rewards. They were just given the game to play. Uh, and you can see here, this is a, a slice of from his fMRI here, bilateral striatum, which is an area of our brain where we're sensitive to reward effects. And you can see in this session one, the people were getting the financial rewards, a lot of activation in this area. That's the red bar here, session one. There was also activation for the people who were just playing the game because of its inherent rewarding qualities. It's a fun game, and so there's also reward um, effects activation going on there, too. In session two, nobody's getting any rewards. Uh, they uh, come back in and they either play the game uh, now with no rewards. And you can see that if this were just an extinction paradigm, what would happen is the red bar would drop to the level of the blue bar, but something else happens to the people who were previously rewarded. Now, they're showing almost no activation in the bilateral stride. I'm saying that they're no longer finding this game rewarding, whereas the people who never got the reward in the first place still do. That's classic undermining effect. It shows up also in, uh, this is the uh, LPFC slice here, which would also be an area of the brain where we think about cognitive engagement occurring. You can see the same pattern of effects here. Cognitive engagement basically dies. And those people who were getting rewards were no longer getting them, but people who were intrinsically motivated to remain engaged. So, I want to get to the pro-social behavior. So, I mean, pro-social behavior has intrinsically motivated qualities. It should show some of these same properties. One of these studies that is not our study, which came from the Max Planck Institute, uh, uh, Warnick and Tomasello, had the same hypothesis that early pro-social behavior in infants is intrinsically motivated. And they showed this, first of all, by showing that uh, infants uh, in really, really begin about 12 months, so you can detect it, but up to 20 months are very spontaneously helpful to other people. So if Corey comes into a room and he drops something, an infant will come over and help him, whereas most of us adults wouldn't care. Infants <laughs> 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 will spontaneously help uh, other people. They will, you know, if you, something's out of reach, they'll try and help you get it. They show that there's a very high base rate of this occurring. So then they had three conditions where they gave uh, kids opportunities to help. And one condition, the neutral condition, they just did nothing after the helping performance. And the second condition, they praised the child for helping. They said, thank you, that was very nice. So a very non-controlling, non-committal kind of praise. And then the third condition, they created a reward uh, that the children all knew about. And when they showed help them, they would say, you get this for doing that. They made it very clear that you were getting the reward for the helping behavior. And then uh, they had a after that condition period was over, they had an opportunity for all children to help over multiple trials. And what they showed was that children who had received a reward for helping were now less likely to spontaneously help an adult than if they had never received the reward at all. So something had been undermined in their intrinsic motivation for helping. And they were using this as an argument that there's some natural propensities we have to be helpers that can be uh, undermined by reward structures. Um, we see the same thing in a lot of our studies. This is a series of studies that Netta Weinstein and I did in, uh, in the JPSP in 2010 that were on adult helping behavior. And our belief was that in order to, if there are really proximal satisfactions in helping, they have to come about when you feel volitional about the helping. Because it wouldn't work as an evolutionary device unless we wanted it to help other people, unless it was coming from ourselves, and, and which wasn't just an expectation of reciprocity. Otherwise, you wouldn't have these selective advantages. So there must be something proximal. So we started to look at helping behavior and then why people were helping. This first one is a daily diary study, so our captain can appreciate the difficulty of uh, these kinds of studies, but this was a, a, a daily uh, diary study where we were tabbing people uh, and finding out about instances where they helped someone else during the daytime, and then we asked them why they helped. 
Uh, you can see that helping in general at the end of the day, if you've helped people on a day, there's a very weak and positive effect of that on your well-being outcomes for the day. But to the degree you helped because you wanted to help, because it was autonomous, uh, for you, there's a much more substantial effect. So on days when people willingly help other people as opposed to did it out of obligation or pressure, uh, that really boosted their well-being. And you can see here that uh, when you take helping instances and look at day-end effects of those, uh, autonomously helping others is associated with increased uh, subjective well-being, increased vitality, and better feelings about the self, uh, whereas uh, helping for control <coughs> and pressure obligations is actually worse than not helping at all. So we can do this experimentally, too. This is one of the experimental uh, uh, studies in this series with that. Uh, we had people playing the dictator game, which is a standard economic game in which uh, you come into the lab and you're told that you're the uh, prosperer, and you get to allocate the money to the other people who come into the lab. So you hear a knock on the door, you know there's a person in the next room, and you're told you can give them as much money on each trial as you want and keep what was remaining. And so what we did is we had people make a choice, in one condition they had a choice about how much money they gave to the uh, other player. And then for the next uh, subject who came in, they were yoked to the prior subject. So they were told, this is how much you should give to the next player. So that's the control of giving here. And you can see that uh, when people had choice, if they gave a little bit, their, uh, their well-being was lower than if they gave a lot. So when they gave more money, they felt better at the end of this experimental task. But that was only true if they did it of their own accord. When they were yoked to do it, they actually had lower feelings and they had to give more. Uh, here's another um, uh, study, which is an experimental study, where we had people enter into a, a joint uh, cognitive task. And we structured it such that only one person uh, of the pair was going to be able to get some rewards for doing well at this task. And so that essentially made the other person now peripheral. But they were given a choice of you could help them if you want to, because a joint uh, contribution here might help their score, so they have the opportunity to do it. And in other cases, we told them they should help uh, the other person, even though they weren't going to do it. So these are controlled help and uh, autonomous help. And you can see that uh, after this experimental task is over, people who help well, autonomously have higher positive affect, more vitality, and more better feelings about themselves. Now, their part the partner in this did not know. Their, their condition did not know whether they were told that they should help, did not know whether they had a choice to help. You can see that when they had a choice to help, the partner's vitality went up, the partner's feelings about self went up. Of course, this is something I think we all know, and we're helped by somebody who's doing it unwillingly. It comes across to us, and it doesn't feel like positive help anymore. So again, the benefits of helping really are only there if it's coming out of a volitional place, at least in terms of these possible well-being supports. So in another recent study, this was done with Frank Martella as a Finnish investigator who came to visit me. And we had a lot of arguments about the role of benevolence in human well-being, uh, but we started to do some experiments on this. He thinks it's very essential for our well-being that we are ongoingly engaged in benevolent behaviors. Uh, that argument aside, uh, we found a game online that's an experimental rice game. Some of you wanted to play this free for play game uh, that you can get online. And when you play this game, as you score in the game, rice is donated to needy people across the world. So we liked that game very much, and we thought, well, we'll use this as a laboratory benevolence game. And what we did is we removed the information about the rice giving for, one, for, the, uh, for the control condition. So in the benevolent condition, you knew the rice was going to the needy people in the control condition. You were just playing a fun game, but you had no awareness of its uh, potential benevolent impact. One of the reasons we like this game is you don't see the people who get the rice, and we constructed it so the experimenter wouldn't uh, really be aware of your contribution, so that it would be completely impersonal giving, just the knowing that some good happened in your act. And uh, what we showed in, in this is that, first of all, people who were in the benevolent condition felt more beneficial, so they saw that they were being benevolent. And this was associated with higher feelings of autonomy, they felt more willing and valued in the task itself felt more effective in what they were doing, and they felt more connection to other people. And these, uh, in turn, uh, mediated these outcomes, which is after the game, uh, they, people who were in the benevolence condition, compared to this fun game condition, felt more vitality, felt more positive affect, uh, also attributed more meaning uh, to the game itself. And this, all of these outcomes were fully mediated by the basic cycle. 
after they finished the game, we then uh, gave them a screw cast because we wanted to investigate the vitality of that. Being beneficial to other people would increase your vitality. It should show up on an ego depletion test. So we uh, stole something from Kathleen and Roy uh, and others, a stroop task to measure this, and we gave them the stroop task. And what you can see here is that people in the benevolence condition um, had a faster time to improve trials, uh, had better performance on this. And this was, again, uh, fully mediated by subjective vitality. So we asked people how much energy do you feel, and that fully mediated this stroop effect uh, between condition and vitality outcomes. I'm going to flip the other side of this for a minute. Am I still within five minutes? Okay, so, as um, I heard the mention of the Milgram game uh, experiments before, a lot of times we think, well, people are willing to not be, not only not be benevolent, but they will be malevolent to other people under many circumstances. And we often cite the Milgram experiment as an instance of this. Everybody in this room knows that this is much more complicated. What happened in the Milgram experiment is that you know, citizens who were in the community came into <coughs> heavy authorities in white coats at a top university, and they were told what to do, and they did it. They complied for the most part, not all of them, but most of them complied. But many of them left miserable, traumatized. Many of them were sweating, many were nervous, many were anxious. Post-interviews have shown that some of these people carried that negative experience with them for years. There was a replication of this in Australia, with really devastating effects on the people who went through it. So people often complied, but not willingly. And so if we were reasoning that that's true. Doing social harm also be, ought to be psychologically needed thwarted, which would be a reason why it might not uh, be something we do that frequently or we do it only under duress. Well, we can't do Milgram experiments anymore, but we have our modern day versions of them. And one of them is Kip Williams' Cyberball game. <laughs> so those of you who know Cyberball know that we can bring people into a lab and let's say this is, uh, these two people are playing, oops, this game. Didn't work with my anime. My one animation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so we bring these two people in the lab, and uh, and let's say that uh, this person here, Tim Casser, is a participant in the experiment. We have them throw the ball to each other, and he is the ostracized person. He's left out. And most of the research has been on the negative effects on the ostracized person. We thought, well, let's flip this, and instead. The subject here will be uh, this woman, Wendy Gromlach, and we'll, when she comes into the lab, these two are confederates, and we say to her, your job is not to throw the ball to this man. So you are in the position of being an ostracizer rather than an ostracized, so we could look at the negative effects of that. And this was studied led by Nikki Legate. And so what we look at here is, first of all, people who are put in the position to ostracize the others have more negative affect as a result of this experience. They have more negative effect than uh, people in a complier condition. And these are people, when they came in lab, we said, your job is to throw the ball equally to the other two people. And then the neutral condition is to throw the ball as they like. You can see the compliers being told what to do. They lost a little bit of autonomy relative to the people who uh, got to freely do it. But the real loss of autonomy is not only being told what to do, but being told to do something that you don't want to do. That's really losing autonomy. And they, they suffer a lot of autonomy and frustration in this and more related <laughs> frustration. And these things completely mediate the negative affect outcome of this. So the, the psychological need thwarted accounts for the change in negative affect. In a second experiment in the same series, uh, we do the same thing. Now we compare the ostracizer condition with the ostracized condition. So some people are being ostracized, some people are being the ones told ostracized. You see that they have comparable levels of distress. Both of them feel distress in this experiment, but different kinds of distress. The ostracizer feels shame and guilt, whereas the ostracized person feels anger. Uh, and who's losing autonomy here? It's the person who's ostracizing. It's the person who's doing the social harm that is feeling like they're the ones in the, in the not autonomous position, whereas both ostracizer and ostracized lose a sense of relatedness. So again, we see the proximal need supports here uh, are working against doing social harm to others. Now, this all fits in with a lot of work we've been doing on people's life goals and why certain life goals make some people happier than others. And I just will say this in brief, which is, you know, we follow a eudaimonic philosophical bent in this. Uh, Aristotle made the argument that the people who really have the good life are the people who live a life of excellence and virtue. And when they're pursuing excellence and virtue, this will in turn lead to happiness, whereas people who are going directly for happiness will hardly ever get there because uh, that's not the route to happiness. 
So this is an uh, empirical question. It's a philosophical <coughs> assertion, but it's really an empirical question. And Tim Cash and I started studying this in the 1990s. We looked at people's life goals and we say, well, what are you after in life? Some people say, well, I'm after giving to my community. Some people are after having intimate relationships. And some people are after growing personally. Those things tend to hold together as a factor we call them intrinsic aspirations. Some other people are into uh, material success, you know, making a lot of money, having a cool image, uh, being famous, and these things tend to hang together too. We call those extrinsic aspirations. And usually most of us have some of both of, of these things. What's interesting is that they differentially relate to well-being outcomes. So this is a standard urban sample that we found. The more people have extrinsic aspirations, the more they have a, a lower self-actualization, the less day-to-day -day energy they're feeling, uh, more symptoms of depression, even physical symptoms, stomach aches, headaches, those kinds of things. Uh, and the opposite is true for people pursuing intrinsic aspirations. We've seen this in multiple samples worldwide, so I'm, I'm not going to, I can't review data here, but there's just widely replicated effect on this. And longitudinal studies show the same thing. This is a study led by Chris Nemec, uh, where we followed people over a couple of your times. First, uh, we, we got their life aspirations, and uh, of course, these are graduates of our University of Rochester, so they get what they want. People who were after money tended to make money over the next year. People who were after giving to the community tended to give their community over the next year. But when you look at the change in well-being outcomes, people who have uh, both aspired to extrinsic aspirations and attained them have had no increase in well-being. And they've had some increase in ill-being symptoms, more uh, especially psychosomatic symptoms. Uh, and uh, whereas people who are attaining more love more community contributions, more personal growth are in fact enhancing in their well-being outcomes. So a very common pattern for us, and uh, I think this ties in again to the whole idea that a part of our adaptive nature, and part of the reason we can live cooperatively is when we're good to one another, uh, we have some proximal psychological benefits. That come. We don't, aren't good to one another so we can have those. We have to, these things follow from being good to one another. So, along with evolutionary psychologists, I think we would posit there's many adaptive benefits, both at the individual and the group level of adaptation for those who buy any group level adaptation issues, which is still controversial. Uh, we think basic psychological need satisfactions represent some of the proximal supports uh, for this kind of kind of benevolent behavior that we do for one another. Uh, and we only get these benefits when we do these things willingly and autonomously. Otherwise, it wouldn't work even if it's an adaptation, if we were looking for reciprocity. And I didn't show data here, but uh, data says that when you give and you expect reciprocity, you don't get these psychological benefits. You don't get the rise in positive back. You don't get the rise in well being. And uh, we showed a little bit of that with uh, the rewarding. And on the reverse side of this, doing social harm to others can be costly to wellness because it thwarts our basic psychological needs satisfaction. So that's a little bad.